Christian. His new book is called Facts and Fears, Hard Truths from a Life in Intelligence. Director Clapper, thank you for being with us nice morning. this morning. Let's start where we just left off with Senator Rubio. Uh, the president is convinced that there was a spy or informant embedded in his campaign, and he is asking this question. He tweeted it yesterday. Why didn't the crooked highest levels of the FBI or justice contact me to tell me of the phony Russia problem? Can you explain why he says the intelligence community did not inform him of this problem? Well, I, I can't uh, uh, say specifically because this would be a judgment to reach by uh, specifically the, uh, the FBI. And they may not have felt that uh, the time was appropriate or, uh, or that, was an, it, that, that there would be any need for it. Uh, depending on on how uh, this progressed, so it's a question of uh, judgment that the uh, FBI would make a tactical judgment to make at the time. But as intelligence director, you didn't weigh in on a decision of whether or not to inform the campaign. No, I did not. I, I wouldn't have known about informants for lots of reasons, though, the, pr pr principally the confidentiality of the program and to protect the individual, uh, his identity, unfortunately, which is, has been exposed. So. Uh, DNI wouldn't necessarily know about any of, of FBI's in, informants, nor uh, should that be made known, any more than, uh, say, CIA assets. This has now become a, a, a talking point for many defenders of the president that he should have been informed. From your point of view, uh, is a generalized briefing just saying, be on alert for counterintelligence uh, attempts here enough, or should the president have specifically, or his campaign been specifically warned about this well, again, targeting or risk? Not knowing exactly uh, what the FBI concerns were, or what they knew, what the predicate was, uh, it's kind of hard to say, but uh, subsequently, certainly, uh, particularly when we became more aware of the uh, Russian cyber uh, intrusions, uh, both campaigns were, were advised of that. Director, you have been critical in your book of the president. He, in turn, has been very critical of you, particularly yeah. this week. And I want to play for you a little bit of sound that we have here uh, in a statement he gave to reporters. Uh, I'll read it to you. We don't have it. He said, there's never been anything like it in the history of our country. If you look at Clapper, he sort of admitted that they had spies in the campaign yesterday inadvertently, but I hope it's not true, but it looks like it is. Can you explain what the FBI's intent was here, and is the president misunderstanding? Well, first of all, it's, it is, uh, I have an aversion to the use of the word spy, but let's just, uh, for the sake of discussion, use that term, which conventionally means the use of tradecraft, using a, a formally trained case officer who would mask identity, who would attempt to recruit. So none of the classical attributes of, of spycraft if I can use that term, we're present here. This is the most benign form of information gathering. So to, to characterize it as, as a spy or spy gate is, of course, part of the narrative. And it's directly antithetical to what I actually said. Well, you said in your book, one of the more um, controversial statements that you made in your conclusion is that uh, Russian influence campaign did end up helping to swing the election towards right. President Trump. What did you conclude that on the basis of? Because you acknowledge it was a very narrow margin of votes that made a difference here. Right. Uh, first of all, I need to uh, stress, Margaret, that the intelligence community assessment that we, official intelligence community assessment that we rendered and delivered, published on the 6th of January, and briefed then President elect Trump at Trump Tower, made no call right. on whether or not the uh, Russian meddling had any impact on the outcome of the election. Uh, didn't have the authority or the capabilities or resources uh, to do that. But as a private citizen, having a good understanding of what the Russians actually did and how massive it was and multidimensional it was and how many voters it touched and the fact that the election turned on less than 80,000 votes in three states, to me it stretches credulity to think that the Russians didn't have profound impact, in fact could have swung, swung the election. This is not an indictment of anybody who voted for President Trump. It is an indictment of the Russians and the serious threat that they pose and, and their intent to undermine our system. But you're saying it's not exactly knowable whether the Clinton loss was a, a direct no. result of not campaigning no, in I would, certain I areas. No, I would call it an, an informed opinion. Got it. 
I want to ask you as well about North Korea. You're an old Korea hand. You visited Pyongyang a few years ago. Today, we're hearing that U.S. officials have crossed the DMZ to meet with North Koreans to plan this upcoming summit with Kim Jong-un. What do they need to nail down to make June 12th worth the president's time? Well, I think uh, they should nail down what, what the outcomes are. Uh, what, what are the intended outcomes for both? And I, I, I do have some thoughts on this. One, I think it would be a really good thing to establish normalized conduit for communication. That, and, and I've been an advocate for a long time of having interest sections established in Pyongyang and Washington at a level below a, a, an embassy, but a diplomatic presence nonetheless, just as we had in Havana, Cuba for decades to deal with a government we didn't recognize. This is not a reward for bad behavior at all. It's mutually reciprocal, and it would give us uh, that presence there, uh, more insight and understanding into North Korea, uh, provide a conduit for information into North Korea, and as well give the North Koreans a sense of security by our having a official U.S. presence there. I also think they should think about um, just listening to what the North Koreans might say when asked, what is it that would take you to feel secure so that you don't need nuclear weapons. And one more point that I ought to think about, when we say denuclearization of the nuclear, uh, uh, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, this could have a two-way street in that the North Koreans could assert that we have a responsibility to denuclearize and restrict our nuclear umbrella, meaning no B-1s, B-2s, or B-52s flying into the Korean Peninsula, uh, landing in the Korean Peninsula, or in operational proximity. So it seems to me that those are things they ought to discuss. But the main point I would make is, why not establish a regular conduit of communications? We will see. Thank you very much, Director Clapper. Thanks, we'll be Mike. right back with a reporter's notebook from our Ben Tracy. He and his CBS News team witnessed what the